<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, it truly is a joy to be here again. I, I'm going to say that probably every week, but I really mean it every week. Uh, I am thankful to be here among you, uh, thankful all the time, anytime we are able to get together and encourage and edify one another as saints in Christ and share the gospel with those that may not have heard it before. Uh, but uh, to come unto the knowledge of the truth is as God's will is. We've been spending a number of weeks and will continue for the foreseeable future uh, looking at verses in particular that say something on ignorance. Uh, this one that we've been on in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, we may, likely not, I'll just say it that way since of how this morning went, uh, get through chapter 12 <coughs> of 1 Corinthians today. But I'll invite you to follow along as always. Uh, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll continue uh, where we all left off last week concerning spiritual things. So as you're turning to find 1 Corinthians 12, I will open with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you, always thank you, for all that you do for us every single day. So very many things go unnoticed, as was said in our humanness. But our, our, our love for you, Lord, is, is, it's hard to describe. Knowing of who we are in Christ Jesus, understanding your love for us through Christ Jesus, it's a marvelous thing to even try to understand. Uh, it's such a joy. So thank you, Lord, for this moment, uh, this time we can gather together amongst the saints. Thank you for your holy word uh, that you've recorded for us, the truth that we can uh, understand and rely upon on this side of heaven, teaching us what is to come and giving us that blessed hope to look forward to. Now, this morning, as we dive further into spiritual things, may your spirit guide us into the truth of it all. Help us to understand what we ought to know and learn uh, as we continue serving as your ambassadors. And once more, Lord, may you guide us in to do those things which are good, to be the light of the world uh, which lies in darkness, that others might be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we've finally been going through some of these gifts. We made it about halfway through the list of spiritual gifts in verses uh, 8 through 10. I'm going to back up to verse 1 and read through 11, just to get the context back in our minds. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that you were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are administrations, of, there's differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, for the last few weeks, we've been talking a lot about spiritual things. Again, verse 1 does just say that. It says now concerning spiritual or spirits or spiritual things in the original language, although gifts is implied by the context of the passage. But it's of this that God does not want us ignorant. We've, I guess I, have voiced many things of, that people are doing which display their ignorance of spiritual things uh, and not not to condescend, but to allow, not allow us to be caught up in it. Uh, we've talked a lot about 
uh, it's not the sign or the gift that's the focus, it's the message. At the end of Mark chapter 16, it says explicitly that, uh, that uh, the, the signs confirmed the words that they were saying. So it's not about the gifts that we should be zealous for, it's about the message, which is today the message of reconciliation, that God bought us back to himself through Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary. We also now today, you have the, so the sign proved the message, sure, but the message still needed to line up with the word and character of God. That was another big deal or issue that has been going on uh, for humanity since the beginning. We looked at many oppor uh, opportunities, many occasions when the, there was a false prophet and a sign that did happen, but the message was a lie or it did not line up with God's word. We also saw many times scripture mentions that there will be signs uh, that are lies. Right? Matthew 24 and 25 and uh, Luke 21 and Mark 13 all talk about the tribulation period and uh, all the signs that will occur during that time frame. Jesus himself even says that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived, if it were possible. So praise God, it's not. But that's how powerful these lies and signs and wonders will be. Uh, they still are around today. People are still trying to lie and deceive with signs and wonders today. So we need to know what is true and what is not. And thus, let us not be ignorant of spiritual things. The reason why we've been spending quite a bit of time on this passage. Now, just to reiterate some things I think that are worth repeating Verse 4 and verse 11 speak of practically the same thing, where it says there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Down in verse 11, it says all these work at the one and self same spirit, dividing to every man and severally as he will. See, it's God's spirit that is handing out the gifts. God is the gift giver. He's handing out gifts. Gifts are not something that we can be trained in or hone in on perfection or anything like that. We can't work at it. It's either a gift that we have or it is not, we meaning humanity, okay? Uh, so, so people that try to sell these things to teach you how to prophesy, to teach you how to speak in tongues or how to heal, it's a lie. Okay? We know that because it's not a gift. God explicitly calls it a gift. As we even go through the different gifts, it says, uh, verse 7, oh, I missed that one, didn't I? The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Again, saying that these are gifts. Verse 8 talks about it's the spirit uh, for the word of wisdom, another the word of knowledge by the same spirit, uh, the faith by the same spirit, healing by the same spirit. So it's, it's very emphatic that it's God's spirit, it's God himself handing out the gifts as he desires. And as we've talked about before, if it's according to God's will, then it must be right and just and good because that's the God I know. And that's the one that's described from Genesis to Revelation. He doesn't make mistakes. Uh, he, he doesn't... He has no respect of persons. I'll put it that way, too. So he gives it exactly where it needs to go. Okay, it's not up to us to do that. Since we've been going through the gifts, the first one is the word of wisdom. And similarly, the second listed is the word of knowledge. Now, we've talked a lot about this. I spent almost one whole message time talking about wisdom in particular. The punchline being, get wisdom. <laughs> Just like it says in the book of Proverbs, get wisdom, hold on to it, don't let it go. Because <laughs> we need to be wise in this life uh, if we want to stand and having done all to stand, like it says in Ephesians 6. Because okay? this world is dark, there's spiritual wickedness in high places, and we are engaged in a spiritual warfare uh, whether we like it or not, just the way it is. So we may as well equip ourselves to stand. So let us not, therefore, be ignorant of this. However, the gift spoken of here is uh, not the wisdom we can glean through study. It's a gift, right? And so uh, I went over explaining that both wisdom and knowledge, this is God supernaturally gifting somebody with his word and the proper interpretation of it. 
Okay, to understand wisdom. It, or to be wise is to not only know something, but to know what is right or what is best, and then going for that. All right, so here's an occasion where God uh, would gift people with this. Now, why would he do that? Well, at the time 1 Corinthians was written, uh, Paul visited Corinth in Acts chapter 18. So this was in the middle of the Acts period, the transition of law to grace, of, of God revealing uh, the revelation of the mystery to the apostle Paul as well. So during this time, sign gifts were prevalent. Why? Because they were following those that believed to confirm the messages. Okay? And so Paul was given a commission by Jesus himself to go to the Gentiles, and so there were a lot of signs to prove that he was sent by God. This wasn't just Paul saying, let's start Paulism or something like that. Okay? So that was going on. They also did not have what we have today. This book that we hold in our hands it is the completed word of God. So at that time, it has not been completed. In 2 Corinthians, Paul still writes, I will, future tense, come to visions and revelations of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1, I think. So um, it's not yet completed. They don't all have the written word in their hand. They don't, and since they don't have his recorded word, God will gift it where it needs to go. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense at that time. We've been doing a lot of comparing to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, where it says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And I pointed out last time that uh, the Greek words here for fail and knowledge are is the same. It's katergao for those that like that sort of thing, but it means to be rendered inoperative or rendered idle. It will not be around anymore, okay? So when it says that prophecies shall fail or knowledge shall vanish away uh, or you know, cease, that sort of thing, it means that it will not be there any longer. Uh, last time I pointed out when it says prophecies shall fail, that doesn't mean that they won't happen. It means that they'll just stop being gifted. Okay, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, about what prophecy exactly is. Okay, so it, at some point, these gifts are going to stop. And right, that's what it says here. Uh, verse 13, though, says what remains. Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love, depending on your uh, translation. That love, regardless of whether you call it agape love or love or charity, is the definition that God provides in this chapter. Okay, so I'm not going to spend time talking about translations or that sort of thing. Uh, it's what God defines it as. It's what it is in this chapter. We'll get to that eventually. Coming back to our list of gifts, though. So we've talked about the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, to another faith by the same Spirit. Now, this one has tripped up many. Uh, if you'd like a reading experience, and I'll just leave it at that. You can find commentaries on the subject, and there will be a million different interpretations, and that's probably not an exaggeration. Okay? Uh, what could this faith be? Uh, I quoted this. I, I left it up here because I think it is more in line with the others that I read, where it says, Faith not of doctrines, but of miracles, confidence in God by the impulse of his spirit that he would enable them to perform any required miracle. And again, the basis of that is chapter 13, verse 2, where it talks about, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. Jesus himself talks about that in Mark 11. We looked at this last time, so I'm not going there again. Uh, but he says, uh, even if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, jump, and it will be removed or some such like that. Uh, so it, it's talking about some sort of extraordinary thing that God is going to do through the believer. Some have talked about how it, it gives people the endurance to carry through some perceivably difficult situation. Uh, the most commonly one cited would be martyrdom. How people can be threatened by the, being told, renounce Jesus or die, and then just say, well, give me death. I mean, that, that's pretty powerful faith, so I, I won't deny that one either. What I have been able to say for certainty, though, is this gift mentioned right here cannot be the saving faith from salvation or from sin and death, okay? because that is available to all. 
God reconciled the world unto himself, not just a select few. And the context of this passage says somebody gets this, somebody gets that, somebody gets that. So this faith isn't for everybody, right? So that's why I can say for certainty that is not regarding salvation from sin, death, and wrath, uh, but it's faith in something else. So that was what triggered me to think, what is that faith? Well, even how it was quoted by, I, I didn't write down who wrote that one, um, confidence in God by the impulse of his spirit. We've shared some testimonies amongst each other how we didn't understand a particular situation, but we just went forward anyway because it seemed like we were being nudged in that direction by God. And that's about as much as we can say because God doesn't speak audibly to us. He doesn't have to. He gave us his full word right here. But we have his spirit in us, so he can still direct and guide us. He can shut doors. He can open doors, if you like that analogy. Uh, and I used myself moving to Florida for an example. I couldn't explain it other than it just seemed like this is what God wanted me to do uh, because I, I resisted it, and it still happened. <laughs> okay? um, I, I went to, and I won't go into the full story again, but I sought out many counselors who I knew to be in Christ and very well-versed in God's word and understanding it, uh, what it for what it says, not just a preconceived doctrinal whatever, uh, denominational anything. So, um, and they, they, every time I talked with somebody, it just seemed like green light after green light, and by seemed like it was, okay? Because I, I would even put little caveats here, like, well, if that doesn't happen, then we're not moving, but it happened. <laughs> so every single time. Uh, so yeah, stuff like that, and could that be the faith that is spoken of here? Well, I think it could be. Because, again, when we look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13, faith sticks around. Right? Faith abides. So even if the rest of these gifts fall away, faith remains. Okay? So that, that is still around today. And I don't think hardly any of you could deny that you've had to endure some things you didn't understand, but because you trusted in God and went for it, well, now hindsight, you can talk about it with confidence, right? So there's, there's my take on that. I did also think of this. Uh, keep a marker here. We'll be back shortly. If you turn to Philipp, uh, no, just kidding. Ephesians chapter 6. If you try to find Philippians 6, you're in trouble. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, where it, I brought this up already, uh, having done all to stand. So I'll give a little context of the passage. Uh, let's start in verse 10. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 10 it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Or in the Greek, that's the heavenlies. Verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. And that's why I brought us to this passage. Taking that shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereto with the perse all perseverance and supplication for all saints. This is one of those moments where there's just no end to the sentence in sight. So, But this is the full armor of God. We could take a whole series to talk about it. But we're, we're speaking of faith, uh, that faith can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Will we be tempted in this life? Yes. Is there going to be false doctrine and lies thrown at us? Yes. But we, through faith in God and the truth of his word, can quench all that. Okay? So that's another reason I brought us, or that's the reason I brought us here, is that this faith uh, will help us to carry on, and having done all, to stand, just like it says in that passage. Coming back then to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the next gift we already spoke about is the gift of healing by the same Spirit. And this, this one should be pretty straightforward. Physical ailments are healed instantly. 
I made a big deal of this last week. I'm going to make a big deal of it again. There's no drama. <laughs> there is zero drama when God healed somebody. Remember the woman that had an infirmity for 18 years? Was that the bowed back woman? I forget which. One had an infirmity 18, the other I think 12. But either way, they, she touched Jesus and was totally fine. She didn't touch Jesus and started doing a little dance or anything like that. No one ran circles around her and said, oh, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, none of that. Okay? So they were healed instantly. And if, if you look and will allow it, which God has it, so hopefully you do, several healings or encounters where Jesus healed someone uh, or even Paul or Peter, it says the word immediately. Okay? And that's exactly what it means. There's no drama. There's no gap. It just happened. We looked at the lame man being healed in Acts 3, where Peter and John said to him, uh, look on us, right? And, and so I don't have silver and gold, but in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he did. And he jumped around and he praised God. And, and, then, and then all the people were wondering, whoa, this guy has been lame for 40 years or more than that. Uh, so they all knew about it. And then that got the Sadducees all messed up because they were preaching the resurrection of Jesus. And the Sadducees, if you didn't know, uh, they're sad, you see, because they don't believe in a resurrection. So I don't know how they could teach that. The resurrection has been taught for a very long time. Job spoke of it uh, in, in his book, the book by his name. But that, again, is another discussion. Uh, there's no drama. The drama, uh, the drama is just flesh marketing or ear tickling. Hey, anyone that, that talks about healing or tries to tell you how to heal uh, instantly, it's just to tickle the ears, and it won't get any further than that. Because I reminded us, not only uh, in 1 Corinthians 13 uh, does healing not abide, uh, right? In chapter 13, verse 13, it doesn't say faith, hope, charity, healing. Uh, just faith, hope, and charity. So it's not there, but every single one of these healings were temporary. Uh, this body is temporary. God's going to give us a brand new one that will not decay, grow old, get sick, or any bad thing. Hey, that's the one we're looking forward to. And I brought up last time, I could be healed of my infirmity, but then what's going to happen? Because just like with owning a house, there's always something to fix. Right? <laughs> these bodies just fall apart. It's, they're not meant to live forever. And quite honestly, it is a blessing that we only live 70, 80 years, or for some, like my grandparents, 100 they did get to that, uh, nearly that age. But uh, on, on the scope of things, I'd much rather be with Christ, with a body that, that is the way it should be, rather than in this earthen tabernacle, put it that way. <laughs> uh, so it's not listed among the things that remain. We looked last time at 1 Timothy 5.23, because I can relate to this one often, uh, where Paul writes to Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach's often infirmities. Paul did not say, now that you've touched my letter, you'll be healed, uh, like it was done in Acts 19. Uh, anything that was on the person of Paul, they would hand around in the cities and villages or whatever, and people would be healed. Okay, that's it's what's recorded in Acts 19, uh, verse 11 and 12. But now he's writing to Timothy, and in 2 Timothy, it was brought up, it was a good point last week, uh, 2 Timothy 4.20 it's mentioned that Paul says, I, Trophimus, have I left at my litum sick? Why would Paul do that if he could just say, well, in the name of Jesus, be healed. All right, see you later. It's because they're passing from the scene. By the time 2 Timothy was written chronologically, uh, that's the last one Paul wrote. So he was given the full revelation there. They didn't need the healing. Again, it's temporary. And once again, the signs were confirming the message. It's not a necessity. Now, if we understand the message, we don't need any of the, the sign gifts at all. And I brought up last time the good news, Philippians chapter 3, how we are citizens in heaven, and God will take this vile body, like how the old English puts it, and he give us a body like unto Jesus' body. That's what we have to look forward to. All right. Next, in our list of gifts, I think that's as far as we made it last week. So there's our recap. Verse 10, it says, To another, the working of miracles. Oh, no, we did talk about this one last week. So the working of miracles can take several forms. We brought up uh, many examples 
last time, the vessels of oil not running out with the prophet Elisha, that was a miracle. The parting of the river by Elijah and Elisha when they slapped it with their clothes, <laughs> that was a miracle. The calming of the wind and waves by Jesus himself, or moving the mountains like we read about and talked about, or raising the dead, all of those things would be miracles. Uh, again, though, this gift is not said to abide. I'm going to bring every gift uh, back to 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. It's not there. Okay? Uh, and last time I just went over why did God, God separate healings and miracles? Because aren't they related? Isn't healing a miraculous thing when they're instantly healed? Like, well, yeah. But God separated them here. He also separated them in Acts 4. It's just that's what he did. <laughs> that's all I've got on that. But again, the point is it's not meant to remain as much as we'd all like to see and experience miracles. I don't need them. All right, then, now I think we're caught up. So verse 10 goes on to say to another prophecy. What is the gift of prophecy and what is prophecy in particular? Well, prophecy is simply telling the word of God. A prophet was a man where in time past where God said something and then that man went and told all these people hey thus saith the Lord that was the prophet's job it was a revealed word of God to somebody and he propagated it he spread the message okay oftentimes the prophet would point out the wrongs of Israel <laughs> if you look look through uh, the Old Testament writings so he's telling Israel, hey, you're off base again, get back in line, or such and such will happen, uh, which typically that such and such happened before they realized, you know what, we sinned, let's get back in line. Uh, so the prophet's job was not always to say, this far away future thing is going to happen. He was also telling them, hey guys, this is what you're doing now and it's wrong, or uh, something along those lines. So that was the prophet's job to tell what God said. Prophecy is specifically told to us that it will fail in chapter 13, verse 8. Uh, it is not said to abide in verse 13. And I recall asking this question, so maybe we talked about this one last week as well, that if it says in chap uh, chapter 13, verse 8, that prophecies fail, so I ask this question, if there are no prophecies, then logically there are no what? Prophets. So anybody alive today that says they are prophets... Are liars because God says it will not happen anymore it will fail it will uh, be rendered inoperative when would that happen when there is no need for God to supernaturally reveal his word in other words when it's all recorded for us right so when it's all been filled up full like God said it was uh, that his design was to fill up full his word through the Apostle Paul uh, the dispensation the, uh, that was committed to him filled up full the word of God. Again, that's Colossians 1.25. Uh, you can read the further context of the passage to get the idea. But once it's full, we don't need any more prophets because we've got it. Uh, we can line up anything necessary against his word, and we no longer need a prophet, I guess. So just say that again. What is interesting, though, that I think I brought up last time as well, at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, he does say... Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to say, covet earnestly the best gifts, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And that excellent way, of course, is charity or love. Uh, but then again, at the end of chapter 14, in verse 39, after spending the chapter of speaking about the gifts of tongues in particular and prophesying, he ends in verse 9 by saying, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak in tongues. So tongues is still important, but not nearly as important as prophesying. And you might ask yourself, why? Well, because prophesying is revealing a direct word of God, and that's important. Tongues were given as a sign to them that believe not. Uh, that is in... I didn't write that down. Well, I know it's in chapter 14. 22. It says, Wherefore, tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe, but for them which, or believe not, but for them which believe. And he's, <laughs> I can't help it. Let's read this next verse. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, 
Will they not say that you are mad? <laughs> you guys are all crazy. You're all speaking all these different languages. Nobody knows what's going on. It's going to look chaotic. Right? And, and again, these tongues, we'll get to this in a moment, they're established languages. It's not gobbledygook like someone aptly mentioned before, uh, like some will try to sell on. Uh, that is not what tongues are. They are languages, established languages. And so they are not to be forbidden, but prophesying is more important because what we see given with tongues, uh, if we were to go to Acts 2, I'll just forego that for now, when um, the, the Holy Spirit came upon the 12 and they all spoke in tongues and all these people from all these other nations, which are more than 12, they all understood, but what did they, under, what did they hear? The wonderful works of God in their own language. Exactly right. So they heard about the works. They heard about, whoa, this is what God did. That's cool. Now what? Right? Because at the end of Acts 2, they were pricked in their heart and they said, what do we do? And that's when he gave them the message. Repent and be baptized. Right? That's Peter giving this message. So tongues were to declare the wonderful works of God for people to understand, hey, I need to trust in God. And then comes the gospel message after that. Chapter 12 in, in 1 Corinthians and verse 28 gives a bit of an order to things. I think we talked about this before as well. I'm having trouble with my memory today. Uh, but it says, God has set some in the church first, apostles, secondarily, prophets, thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, government, diversities of tongues. Okay, so there's a bit of an order going on here. And I suppose we'll talk about more of that in a minute. But you think about it, it's logically set out. Apostles, these are ones directly commissioned by God. They are sent ones. That's what the term means. So they are sent on a mission by God to do their thing. Prophets, they're the ones getting direct messages from God to tell everybody, hey, thus saith the Lord. Thirdly, teachers, they're going to teach people about the ways of God and his word. Right. So it makes sense how God has ordered these things. Uh, but then again, for people not to covet anything in particular. All right, that's the point of, of this chapter here is to say, don't forget, we're all one body. Okay? We're all members of the body, and every one of you is essential. And that's, that's the point that he's getting across. All these gifts are given by God's Spirit. They're put exactly where they need to be. So don't covet the gifts. Just praise the Lord right? that he's working in and among all his believers. Just a moment. I wrote a lot of notes about prophets. I don't think we need to really get into all of that. But again, once the word of God is established, there's no need for prophecies or divine revelation. Okay, enough said. Uh, back to verse 10 in chapter 12. The next gift said is discerning of spirits. Now, what is that? What's going on? With all these spiritual gifts, again, try to place yourself in that situation. There's spiritual stuff, supernatural stuff going on here, there, and everywhere especially during the days of Jesus Christ and shortly thereafter. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going on. I mean, I don't know how, you can't read very far before you read about someone casting out unclean spirits or healings or this or whatever, or him calming the wind and the waves. There's just a lot going on in a short, relatively short amount of time. So with all the spiritual gifts that are going on, logically then there'd need to be some sort of interpretation if these spiritual things are for God or not, Right? So we've looked at many signs, things that are occurring that were not of a clean spirit. And again, that the Antichrist or the beast of the book of Revelation, that they will perform many signs, but they're not for God. They are for Satan. Even in this chapter, before God spoke of spiritual things, there's that reminder in verse 2 and 3. It says, you know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand. So you got to understand this thing first and foremost, that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So if the Holy Spirit lives in someone, they're not going to curse God because God is living in them. Likewise, no one that is unsaved or does not have the Holy Spirit in them is going to say Jesus is Lord. And they just won't do it because in unregenerate man's mind, I am Lord, right? I am God. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3 where uh, Satan tricked Eve in saying, you can be just like God. 
And ever since then, that's what we inherited from Adam, right? Our sin nature. That's what the flesh does. The flesh and, and spirit are at enmity one against another. That's what Galatians 5 says. We could exude the, spirit, the fruit of the flesh in our lives, which are manifest, right? Fornication, adultery, pretty much every hateful thing. Or we can exude these fruit of the spirit in our lives, which actually, if you turn to Galatians 5, verse 22, what is the first thing that's listed? Love. <laughs> and uh, 1 Corinthians 13, but these abide, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So that is the number one thing that should be prevalent in the Christian's day-to-day -day life. They love one another. And we could go on with the rest of this. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, in other words, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, humbleness, in other words, temperance, self-control. Against such there is no law. So following after the Spirit, allowing the Spirit to work in us, and not give any our, our liberty as an occasion to the flesh, like that passage says in verse 13, then we will have no condemnation, right? That, just like it says in Romans 8. Those that walk in the Spirit, we won't have anything to say against us. And is it, um, I think it's Titus chapter 2, where Paul says to him, you know, you do what's right so that no one can speak evilly against you. All right, so that's, that's something that's reiterated uh, throughout. So there's, I guess, a little bit of a, digression onto the practical day-to-day -day of what we ought to uh, live for. But we're getting back onto the topic of discerning of spirits. So uh, they were reminded in, in the early verses here that they were following after dumb idols. So in other words, these sticks and rocks that you were praying to and saying, save us, they can't say anything. They can't do anything. They, uh, they, <clears throat> they're not the right spirit. Uh, even going back to uh, chapter 10 when they said, well, what about eating food sacrificed to idols? It's just food, right? But uh, they re he reminded them that those things that Gentiles sacrifice to idols, they're sacrificing to devils, unclean spirits. I don't want you having anything to do with that. Right? So it kind of comes along with the discerning of spirits. They need to understand, well, what's right, what's wrong. Uh, 1 John 4 speaks of discerning of spirits. First John 4, and the first couple of verses says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that, is, that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Okay? So a discerning of spirits is very simple. Right? Both Paul and John said practically the same thing. Right? If the spirit, if there's something supernatural going on and the spiritual thing is saying, yes, Jesus is Lord of all, well, okay then. But if it doesn't, then not so much. And while they did not have, again, the complete written word of God to base things off of, they needed to discern in some way. Right? There needed to be some sort of discerning of spirits. However, this is, once more, not listed in 1 Corinthians 13.13 13 as abiding. Today, we can line up everything once again by the recorded written word of God. I made mention, and it was even brought up again this morning, about how much... Music does not confess Jesus Christ or even the name Jesus, and sometimes not even the word God. Right? So there's a lot of so-called contemporary, con contemporary Christian music that isn't even Christian. Uh, it's pretty feel-good stuff tickling the ears as well. That doesn't cover everything. Of course, there are sincere believers uh, doing so. And we as believers can still use those words because a lot of them are praising the God, if praising the one true God, if our heart truly is for him. All right. Wow. I think we covered them. Oh, tongues. How could I forget? All right, so coming back to 1 Corinthians 12, <laughs> verse 10. Wow. How did I miss that one? So the, the last two gifts listed here go together. 
uh, diverse kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. So again, these are established languages. I talked about this in Acts 2, and for time's sake, I don't think we're going to go there. Uh, but the, these were to declare the wonderful works of God in the unbelievers' language that they may hear and believe. That was the point of speaking in tongues. So, and if someone was not able to understand, uh, like everybody else, like maybe there's a visit from a foreign nation, visitor, from a foreign nation come into a local gathering of the church and someone starts talking in that language and the bulk of the people are like, what is he saying? Well, then someone in that assembly would also be gifted with, well, here's what he said. Right? Even though they have no idea what that language was, was never trained in it, never uh, spoke it perhaps in their life, but now they can. This is a supernatural gifting of God so that everybody can be on the same page. Right? And we'll, we'll talk more of tongues as we continue verse by verse into chapter 14. Tongues is not said to be abiding in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Hopefully you're not getting sick of me saying that, but you know, none of these abide except faith, hope, and love or charity. So tongues, again, is something that will cease. if people. And I know people say this, that you must speak in tongues to prove the Holy Spirit is in you. That's a lie. I don't know what verse they try to base that on. I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Uh, in fact, I see quite the opposite. You don't need to speak in tongues at all to prove the Holy Spirit is in you. Uh, your life ought to be a witness and testament that the Holy Spirit is living in you, causing you to do those things which are right. You should see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. But did you notice that one key word that I used? Should. You don't have to. <laughs> it's entirely between your heart and God whether you are in Christ or not. Sincerely trust that Jesus paid for your sins on the cross of Calvary. His blood paid for it in full. Put your faith and trust in that, and in that moment of faith, you are in Christ with his spirit and all the spiritual blessings that go with it. Okay? That is entirely between uh, the individual and with God. You don't have to prove it to man. Okay? And, and I guess that's, that's what I'll say about that. There's a lot of ignorance on these gifts, and I'm hoping as we continue to go through this, that that ignorance is washed away. Uh, so these, these are the ones that are listed that we've gone over. However, it's not all to be ignorant of concerning spiritual things, because God knows us better than we do. And so right after this, he's going to, I don't want to say talk to us like children, but it's kind of what it is, uh, giving us a picture to understand that we're all on the same team, right? You don't have to fight one another. You don't have to be like a kid and try to take something out of your friend's hand because that's just what you want, right? We don't have to covet uh, these, you know, like I want his word of wisdom and I want uh, her ability to speak in tongues or something. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's not the whole focus. But as we read here in verse 11, all these, all these gifts are worked out by that one and self same spirit and it's God dividing to every man severally as he will. Uh, let's just read verses 12 to 14. We'll end there this week and uh, continue on next week. Uh, it says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now, going back to our early school days, this is going to be an analogy. Okay? Uh, so we can understand as a body, it's got head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Anyone want to sing that song? <laughs> a whole bunch of different parts, but it's one body. So just like that, so is Christ. Okay? So Christ is going to be one body, but lots of members. That's the idea. Verse 13 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Okay? So this is the one baptism for today. We'll start by talking about that next week. However, when anybody, who tr anybody trusts in what God has done, his gospel of reconciliation, the gospel of the grace of God, the glorious gospel of God, it goes by many names, but it's still the best news we can hear this side of heaven, that Jesus paid it all, 
Now, his blood paid for it out my sin in full. Using myself, but this works for anybody that believes. Uh, he paid for my sin in full, so when I trust him, I am complete in Christ. That means there's no more work that needs to be done. There's nothing I have to do. I already have all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. I can't do something so that God owes me more. Okay? That's a little silly to think of it that way. So I already have it by faith. What then should happen is I should be zealous for good works to serve my God who just did that for me. Because I couldn't earn that on my own. I couldn't do it on my own, but God did it. And in that very moment, his own spirit took me, who was dead in trespasses and sins, and placed me, baptized me, into the body of Christ, where there is Jew, Gentile, bond, free, male, female. It doesn't matter. We'll look at these verses next week, too. I got a whole list of them that say practically the same thing. But now I'm in Christ, and I am free from the bondage of sin and death. So praise the Lord for that message. May we all trust it and live it. And let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, thank you again for this time and how we wish it just never ended. I'm so thankful, Lord, uh, for your gospel of reconciliation, that message that we proclaim today. Uh, thank you for completing us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for explaining to us in your word exactly what that means, uh, helping us to live a life right now that's profitable uh, both here and uh, in eternity that is to come. May you guide us uh, ever further into your word, into your wisdom, that we may continue to represent you well as your ambassadors, that no one may speak evilly against us either, uh, that uh, all glory and honor would come to you, uh, Almighty Father. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen.